from World News Tonight. More visits. Spain's Prime Minister visits Kiev just hours after Putin threatened the West of nuclear escalations. Mine collapsed. Rescue efforts are underway as a mine in Inner Mongolia collapses with workers inside. More earthquakes. A 7.2 magnitude earthquake hits Tajikistan in the latest of a series of earthquakes in Eurasia. A feline rescue. White helmets in Turkey rescues a furry friend for weeks after Turkey's earthquake disaster. is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you are joining us on World News. We start off tonight's broadcast with the mysterious objects that floated ashore in Japan. A large metal sphere that washed up on a beach in Japan was filmed by an eyewitness. The object had been sealed off as officials were examining it. However, local media reported that the object was not deemed to be a threat. Many suspect it to be a type of buoy. The find in coastal city Hamamatsu has been variously dubbed Godzilla Egg, Mooring Boy, and From Outer Space by fascinated locals. Japan's media showed footage of two officials on Enushuhama Beach looking at the rusty metal sphere that appeared about 1.5 meters wide. It had been found by a local who alerted police after noticing the unusual object on the show. Authorities cordoned off the area and conducted X-ray exams, which did not reveal much more other than confirming that the object was safe. A runner on the beach told local media he was surprised by the commotion as the ball had been there for some time. This kind of find might not normally raise suspicion, but it comes amid general nervousness over unidentified objects since the US shot down a suspected Chinese spy balloon earlier this month. Japan separately expressed concerns to China about suspected surveillance balloons spotted over its skies at least three times since 2019, an allegation it first made last week. Beijing denies such claims of espionage. Meanwhile, a search and rescue operation is underway after a coal mine collapsed in Aulsa League of North China's Inner Mongolia Autonomous Region, and more emergency forces are being rushed to the site. The collapse happened at around 1300 local time, killing four people and injuring six others. The collapse on Wednesday at an open pit mine in the Alsa League, operated by Xinjing Coal Mining Corporation, left a pile of debris roughly 500 meters across an estimated 80 meter high. President Xi Jinping on Wednesday ordered search and rescue efforts, saying, quote, he must make every possible effort to rescue the missing persons and treat the injured, although a second landslide in the evening hampered the work to find survivors. Premier Li Qichang also demanded a quick investigation into the cause of the collapse. Coal is a major source of energy in China, but its mines are among the world's deadliest, largely due to lax enforcement of safety standards, despite repeated government orders for improvements in safety over the years. China's mines have also been trying to boost output over the past year under a government call for greater supplies and stable prices. 300 fire rescue personnel, 60 fire engines and 6 search and rescue dogs were at the scene on Thursday to aid the search for trapped miners. The National Health Commission said on Wednesday evening six injured people had been rescued and it had sent 15 ambulances and 45 medical staff to help with the rescue. The previously underground mine was converted into an open pit operation in 2012 and it had suspended production for three years before restarting in April 2021. Now, the COVID pandemic had taken a toll on all nations, and it was a time where all lives were disrupted in different ways. And for some, the fear of getting the virus had taken over their normal lives. There was an incident in India where a mother had self-imposed a lockdown. Residents in India's northern Gurugram city who are living their regular lives in an arguably coronavirus-free world witnessed the shocking incident as a mother and her child were rescued out of their apartment three years after the woman set a self-imposed lockdown. Moon Moon Maji, who hails from the eastern West Bengal state, locked herself and her child in 2020 as she feared she would lose her then eight-year-old to the deadly virus. Moon Moon had also shut the doors on her husband Suman Maji after he stepped out of their house following the end of the first lockdown in 2020. Solanki added that Suman had filed a complaint with the police about Moon Moon neither letting their son out nor allowing him to see his boy for the past three years. The wrecked Maji house was seen hoarded with piles of garbage and walls full of drawing made by their 11-year-old son. Psychologists and psychiatrists around the world are beginning to report signs of distress among patients worried about the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic that has claimed 530,763 lives in India as per the government figures. 
Well, it seems like earthquakes are going to be a frequent occurrence now as a series of earthquakes shook Tajikistan earlier today, the strongest of which measured at magnitude 7.2. The earthquakes were felt in capital Dushanbe, but its epicenter was in the east of the country, closer to the border with China. The area is sparsely populated but is home to the Sarez Lake, which could potentially flood vast areas in several countries. The Mukhrab is the district capital with a population of a few thousand people high in the Pamir Mountains. The quake was strongly felt across the border in some areas of Kashgar Prefecture and Kizilsu Kyrgyz Autonomous Prefecture in Xinjiang. But no casualties or damage had been reported so far. Now, sheriff deputies in Florida said today that four people were shot and two were killed on Wednesday afternoon in the same area where a woman was found dead earlier on the same day. The Orange County Sheriff's Office said that one person was detained after the afternoon shooting. Sheriff John Mina said that the officers responded to reports of a shooting in the same area and added that a reporter and a photographer with Spectrum News 13 in Orlando, Florida were shot. Mina added that one of the News 13 employees were killed. After shooting at the News 13 card, the 19-year-old suspected allegedly went to a nearby house and shot her mother and her 9-year-old daughter, Mina said, adding that the 9-year-old had died. Mina said that Keith Melvis Moses, who is 19 years old, is in custody and is accused of being responsible for both shootings on Wednesday, which resulted in two deaths and three injuries. The sheriff said that Moses has a lengthy criminal history, ranging from gun charges, aggravated assault, aggravated battery assault, with a deadly weapon, burglary and grand theft. He added that Moses was an acquaintance of the woman killed earlier, but has no connection with the mother and the nine-year-old or journalist who was shot. Sheriff Mina said that it's unclear why the journalists were targeted. At least 11 Palestinian extremists were killed during a rare daytime raid by Israeli military forces in Israel's West Bank that also left more than 100 injured. Several Palestinians went on strike after Israel flurried Gaza with missiles in further attacks. Israeli troops besieged this building in the flashpoint city of Nablus in the occupied West Bank. It's ruined testimony to the deadly clash that followed. Among the Palestinian dead, at least three gunmen and three civilians, including a 72-year-old man and a 14-year-old boy. In total, at least 10 were killed. More than 100 other Palestinians were wounded, according to witnesses and medics. Israel's military said there were no Israeli casualties. The Israelis encircled two Islamic Jihad commanders in the house, the Palestinian militant faction confirmed. That triggered fighting that drew in other gunmen. The two commanders were killed. The Israeli military said troops shot back after coming under fire. They were trying to detain militants suspected of planning imminent attacks. Israel has intensified raids in the West Bank, especially Nablus and nearby Jenin, over the last year, following a spate of lethal street attacks by Palestinians in Israeli cities. 60 Palestinians, both gunmen and civilians, have been killed in 2023, the Palestinian Health Ministry says. Israel says 10 Israelis and a Ukrainian tourist died in Palestinian attacks in that period. Hamas said one of its own gunmen was also killed in Wednesday's raid. It hinted at possible reprisals from the Gaza Strip, a territory that it controls. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Russian President Vladimir Putin has said that the Russian Federation will pay increased attention to boosting its nuclear forces. The comments coming just a day after the Kremlin suspended adherence to the New START nuclear treaty, further increasing fears worldwide of a global nuclear weapon-centered conflict. In a video address marking Thursday's Defender of the Fatherland holiday in Russia, President Vladimir Putin said his country will now pay increased attention to boosting its nuclear forces while equipping its armed forces with the latest advanced equipment and weapons. This includes Russia's plans to begin mass deliveries of Zircon Sea-launched hypersonic missiles. His comments also come just a day after he announced that Russia will be suspending the New START nuclear weapons control treaty between Moscow and Washington. Putin's comments on suspending the New START treaty and focusing the country's attention on boosting its nuclear forces are raising concerns that Moscow might be headed toward preparing for a nuclear war. 
However, in a response to the growing fears, Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov held a conference call with reporters on Wednesday, stressing that suspension of the treaty does not increase the risk of a nuclear war. Instead, Peskov added that Moscow is willing to return to adhering to the treaty as soon as the West is ready to consider Russia's concerns. Meanwhile, in a meeting with leaders from NATO's eastern flank on Wednesday, U.S. President Joe Biden said President Putin made a big mistake by suspending his country's participation in the Nuclear Arms Control Treaty. Biden sat down with the leaders of the so-called Bucharest Nine to show his support for security in the region. The leaders of countries located close to Russia, including Poland, Bulgaria and Romania, voiced the need to strengthen defense capabilities on NATO's eastern flank and to prepare for potential threats from Russia. In a joint statement adopted on Wednesday, the leaders of the B-9 vowed to strengthen deterrence and defense power across the entire eastern region, while also condemning Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez arrived in Ukraine to meet President Volodymyr Zelensky on the eve of the first anniversary of Russia's invasion on his arrival in Kyiv. Sanchez was received by Ukraine's Deputy Foreign Minister, the Ukrainian Ambassador in Madrid and the Spanish Ambassador to Ukraine. Sanchez's visit comes after U.S. President Joe Biden had promised new military aid for Ukraine worth $500 million during a surprise visit to Kyiv on Monday. Sanchez also plans to visit Bucha and Irpin, two towns near Kyiv that have become synonymous with alleged Russian war crimes. In addition, he lay a wreath at a war memorial. On Tuesday, Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni also visited the Ukrainian capital for talks with Zelensky, whom she pledged to continue supporting in resisting Russian attacks but ruled out offering fighter jets. Spain is amongst a number of NATO allies that have agreed to send modern tanks to Ukraine and has trained 800 Ukrainian troops in the Iberian country since the start of war. Spain's Defense Minister Margarita Robles told lawmakers in the lower house that Madrid would supply six German-made 2A4 Leopard battle tanks to Ukraine after they undergo repairs, with the delivery expected for late March or early April. Sanchez's trip follows a highly secretive visit by Joe Biden to the Ukrainian capital on Monday, in which the U.S. president announced a half a billion dollars in new assistance to Kyiv. Astronomers have used the James Webb Space Telescope to peer back in time to the early days of the universe, and they spotted something unexpected. Decentivizing major physics theories such as the Big Bang Theory, the Space Observatory revealed six massive galaxies that existed between 500 million and 700 million years after the Big Bang that created the universe. The discovery is completely upending existing theories about the origins of galaxies, according to a new study published Wednesday in the journal Nature. The telescope observes the universe in infrared light, which is invisible to the human eye and is capable of detecting the faint light from ancient stars and galaxies. By peering into the distant universe, the observatory can essentially see back in time up to about 13.5 billion years ago. The galaxies are so massive that they conflict with 99% of models representing early galaxies in the universe, which means scientists need to rethink how galaxies formed and evolved. The current theory suggests that galaxies began as small clouds of stars and dust that grew over time. Scientists believe that there is a real possibility that a few of these objects turned out to be obscured supermassive black holes. Regardless, the amount of mass discovered means that the known mass in stars at this period of the universe is up to 100 times greater than what scientists had previously thought of. Now, amid the country's record low birth rate, South Korea is seeing fewer and fewer pediatricians. This is leading to a lack of accessibility for sick children in certain areas of the country, making parents feel helpless. The health ministry today put forth some measures to tackle this, followed by an order by President Yoon himself. South Korea is looking to improve its health care system for young children. Currently, according to the health ministry, the country is seeing a shortage of pediatricians, while some medical facilities specifically for children are having to be shut down. This leaves some parents helpless during dire situations, especially outside the capital region. And so on Wednesday, three major goals were announced. One, quickly expand medical infrastructure for severe pediatric cases. Two, overcome blind spots in children's medical care. And three, expand manpower through fair compensation. Specific plans included creating four more public children's hospitals to add to the current 10 and expanding support for the existing ones, creating a 24-hour hotline and video call system with pediatric professionals and 
the test running of a compensation system for business losses incurred by children's hospitals. In addition, the ministry will lay out the requirements for the 45 top recognized medical centers, which include having a pediatric center and 24-hour emergency care for children. This comes as President Yoon Song Nyer had already called for such policies to be implemented and on Wednesday went to visit Seoul National University's Children's Hospital to see the current situation. Saying that protecting children's health is a country's first and foremost responsibility, he acknowledged the dire situation himself. In a briefing after the event, the presidential spokesperson said Yoon has called for immediate changes. The president said doctors avoiding becoming pediatricians is not their fault, it's the government's fault. Adding that he said what was discussed on Wednesday has to be implemented well and there's nothing more urgent. So if the national insurance isn't enough, the government should put in some of its budget for these changes. During his visit, President Yoon also met with some young patients fighting severe diseases. This included a cancer patient of 19 months. Yoon showed his support for the parents and medical staff fighting with them. Qantas Airways Limited posted a record profit in the first half, rebounding from five straight half-year losses, and announced a $500 million share buyback, adding that it expects airfares to remain above pre-COVID levels, although moderating in the next half. Australia's biggest airline saw a record profit for the first half of the financial year, while its fares remain sky high. Qantas Airways raked in nearly a billion US dollars as it rode a boom after years of losses during the global health crisis. The company said Thursday that ticket prices will fall in the months ahead as the company and its competitors add more flights. But while it and airlines around the world have enjoyed raging demand from people ready to travel again, Jacking up fares and profits, cost of living is steadily creeping up, with wallets squeezed by groceries, fuel and mortgages. Still, Qantas CEO Alan Joyce told reporters he expects hunger for travel well into 2024. While interest rates and inflation are expected to hit discretionary spending at some point, we've yet to see any signs of that in our bookings, in our forward bookings. In fact, the research shows that travel is one area that people want to prioritize over the next 12 months. The threat of a cost of living crunch is a taste of what U.S. private equity firm Bain Capital will face if it proceeds with an IPO for domestic rival Virgin Australia this year. For now, Qantas feels comfortable enough for a stock buyback it announced Thursday to the tune of some 340 million U.S. dollars. But investors were startled enough by estimates ticket prices will subside that share values tumbled down by 7% after Joyce spoke. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. A teenage pupil stabbed to death a teacher in the middle of a lesson at a school in southwest France. The teacher of Spanish 52 was teaching a class at the school in the seaside town of Saint Jean de Luz when the 16 year old attacked her with a knife. Diego Schwartzman was eliminated from the first round of the Rio Open on Wednesday by Serbia's Dusan Lajovic. The number five seed struggled to get the rhythm together, leaving himself open to the Serb, who converted four of ten breakpoint opportunities on his way to a straight set victory. Former US President Donald Trump headed to an Ohio town in the center of a train disaster where he is seeking to build support and as residents fight for a more robust response from federal agencies. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres condemned Russia's invasion of Ukraine, calling it an affront to a collective conscience, as the General Assembly met in a special session two days before the anniversary of Moscow's attack. Amid fears that a close poll may be disputed and trigger even more violence and chaos, all Nigerian candidates signed the peace pledge promising to seek redress through the courts for any grievances. Nigerians will vote in what could be their most credible and close electoral contest since military rule ended nearly a quarter of a century ago. Mexican faithful on their way to work received ash cross markings on their forehead outside a metro station in Mexico City to celebrate Ash Wednesday and mark the first day of Lent. People queued outside the busy Insurgentes metro station as a priest applied the ashes to the foreheads of the parishioners and blessed them. And that is
is all we have on World News tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can always rewatch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. And finally, we leave you tonight with a feline friend that was rescued by the White Helmets in the aftermath of the Turkey earthquake that happened a week ago. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.